Hi everyone. I have the great pleasure to be here with Paul Gulbranson. Hi Paul. Hello. Welcome. Uh, Paul will give today the first keynote speech in the context of the second conference on non-caring discourse that this year will explore the conceptual, ethical and practical challenges to the shared decision-making paradigm. So thanks for being here, Paul, and thanks for taking part in this virtual edition of Caring Discourse. Thank you very much. So uh, Paul Gulbranson is Professor of Health Services Research at the Institute of Clinical Medicine, University of Oslo and uh, Akershus University Hospital. Paul is a specialist in public health and general practice. Um, he published more than 100 original scientific papers, many of them also on communication issues. His interests span public health, physician-patient relation, medical ethic, and clinical communication. Among his many activities, acknowledgements, and research outputs, let me uh, at least mention he is the co-founder together, uh, together with Herstein Finset of the Oslo Communication in Healthcare Education and Research Group that organizes uh, also an annual international research workshop held for the ninth time in 2020 and counting on the participation from 10 countries. Um, so the title of uh, today's talk is uh, Shared Decision Making or Contextualized Decision Making. So Paul, I give the floor to you and thanks again for being here today. Thank you very much, Maria Grazia, for this nice uh, introduction. And uh, let me just say that I would have loved to be in Lisbon meeting the audience and communicate with them. It's a strange thing to be mm -hmm. online like this, yes. but uh, we'll do our best and uh, see if uh, we can contribute to some discussion for people afterwards. I really appreciate it. So, so uh, next slide. Um, I I was invited, I think, to this uh, uh, conference because of an editorial that I wrote uh, uh, in um, patient education and counseling last year with Jennifer Gerwing. Next, please. Uh, who um, who is one of my favorite co uh, workers, and she's just probably the best video analyst I know in the world. Uh, she's just fantastic and she has taught me a lot. And we work and discuss together, uh, even if she works in Canada most of the time. So uh, I'd just like to, to thank her and promote her uh, uh, work. Um, we uh, and I have been uh, concerned about shared decision making for a while. I mean, I'm definitely a proponent of it, uh, but first of all, you basically don't see a lot of it around, uh, particularly not in, in hospitals, but also not other places. And the other thing is um, when it's uh, tried uh, and done, it's certainly not often very well functioning because usually the doctors really haven't caught the concept uh, and how difficult it is. So I've been uh, wondering about uh, this term, shared decision-making, and I went to the roots to where it was um, uh, uh, found first in the literature, and that was in a paper by Beach in the Hastings Center report way back in 1972. And interestingly, it didn't say shared decision-making, it said sharing of decision-making. And when Beach wrote about this, he was actually uh, picturing uh, a meeting between two people who shared their ways of deciding things. Um, so it was more like the doctor shared with the patient how he was thinking and the patient shared with the doctors how she was thinking. Uh, and it wasn't sort of named uh, like a complete process with a clear uh, description and a goal. Next, please. And 
uh, it was not until 10 years later at, as at this term shared decision making was sort of suddenly appearing uh, uh, among other places in the presidential report in the United States. And now he's, of course, as most people uh, listening to this would be very interested in and know that this term uh, has been important in medicine now for, let's say, almost 40 years. So I, uh, you said uh, originally, Maria Gracia, that I'm also a specialist in public health and I'm really, really very interest, interested in um, how we doctors relate to the patient's social context. Next. Uh, and uh, I wrote this uh, editorial with Jennifer, uh, building a lot on a fantastic book uh, that I will come back to later, uh, Listening for What Matters, uh, Avoiding Contextual Errors in Healthcare. Next, please. There is a gap between the ideal and the practice. And we can say that Share decision making is a normative ideal, and maybe it's right to say that it where it was formulated before accurate description of observed practice actually were clearly articulated. There were uh, studies in the 17th about uh, doctor patient communications, but now, uh, 50 years later, we have tons of observations and we have seen much more than was the case then, at that time. And also the shared decision making uh, is usually confined to one decision. There's a persistent implicit assumption that of a single preference sensitive decision that is there in any given encounter. However, decisions are embedded along a screening, a diagnostic, a treatment pathway, and seemingly minor decisions may make later invasive decisions inevitable. So, so it's not always clear at what time the really important decision is made. And in a study that uh, my colleague Eirik Ufsta and others did a few years ago, we looked at 372 videos from hospital encounters. And we saw that doctors articulated 40 decisions per hour in those studies. And among those, it's obvious that they cannot all be discussed with the patients. Uh, and also many of the decisions were actually made before the encounters and just brought into the encounter as an information to the patients. Most of the decisions were made there and then. And then there were also a lot of conditional decisions that were talked about that if this happens, you should do that. Or if this happens, you should do that. So this is almost a cacophony of information that the patients have to deal with in meetings with doctors. And most decisions that are made during a clinical interaction, they are not isolated from a wider epistemological context. And this brings me back to uh, next place to the book I mentioned uh, initially by these two guys. Uh, the guy to the right is uh, Saul Wiener. He is a pediatrician and a clinician at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Chicago. And he's also at the University of Illinois Chicago as a researcher. And uh, the guy to the left is Alan Schwartz, his collaborator on this big study. And he is uh, a psychologist and also actually the current uh, and has been for many years um, editor of Medical Decision Making, the journal. And it takes too much time to go through their total work, uh, but basically they have started this enormous study by having uh, uh, actors, uh, coming to doctors uh, with a sort of a script, a standardized script uh, of their problems. And the doctors in the uh, veterans administration system, they knew that some patients might be actors but and had accepted it, but they didn't know who. And they found then that a lot of the uh, hints and keys that the 
actors actually gave about uh, life problems, things that were actually difficult for them, and just both diagnostically, but also for completing treatment, that they were missed by the doctors. So after they demonstrated this, they brought in uh, real patients, patients that were asked if they were willing to carry a concealed uh, audio uh, recorder. Uh, and then they have lots of data from real patients meeting doctors and they were able to see that the doctors missed really important information and they were also able to see that this actually bore on what the doctors wrote in the medical records and in the end actually had a significant uh, uh, effect on the health care both the quality of it but also on actually uh, the costs of it making it more expensive so this book which is a very easy read is a really fantastic book telling us of the importance of patients lives uh, when we meet them in the doctor's office and that we cannot ignore that even for uh, cases and problems that seemingly are not so important. This study was made in a hospital outpatient clinic. Uh, and we might think that this problem of doctors ignoring patients' uh, context is maybe something that is confined to hospital uh, care. But that is actually not the case. Uh, I used to work as a general practitioner uh, in the 80s and 90s. And when I did my PhD, I studied if the general practitioners actually knew their patients so well as they claimed they did, because that's sort of a, a mantra of general practice that you know the patients well. And I had started in my practice to change my communication style uh, because I felt I didn't really understand my patients always and what they were actually the symptoms and what they, why they didn't uh, complete the treatment. And then I found that when I changed my communication style, just somewhat, not really much, uh, but listening more, talking less, I discovered that there were lots of patients I thought I knew well that I actually didn't know well. So that was why I started this study. Next, please. So in a big study with 1,400 uh, patients and 90 general practitioners, uh, we asked the patients uh, in questionnaires about several uh, life uh, problems. And we didn't just ask them if they had these problems. We asked specifically if we, if they said yes, or if they said uncertain, we asked specifically uh, whether they thought this problem was affecting their health. Because if the patients felt that their problem was affecting their health, it was, in my view, actually interesting if the doctors knew about it. And we found in that study that at least one third of the patients in general practice had psychosocial problems that they perceived as influencing their present health, one third. And what we also found was that the general practitioners recognized uh, from 20 to 50% of these problems, depending on the type of problem, like, for example, if the patients have been sub, uh, subject to violence or threats from people that they felt close to, the doctors would usually not know about it, only one fifth of the cases, while problems related to working life, which are less considered uh, or connected to feeling, for example, of shame, the doctors knew about it much more often, up to almost 50%. But anyway, it's still another 50% with such problems uh, that the doctors did not know about. 
And what we also found was that uh, variations in the patient's w wishes and abilities to communicate, but also the need for confidence in the relationship before revealing intimate problems. And finally, in importantly, a tendency for doctors to actually be entrapped by their expectations that uh, were reasons for these findings. And one example of the latter is that um, uh, if a patient felt really lonely and so lonely, it actually affected the patient's health, the doctors would know about it if it was an old person living alone, but if it was a person uh, in a medium age group, 30 to 50, with a family, with a job, and still feeling that lonely, the doctors wouldn't know it. Of course, that is a presupposition thing. So basically, when we are trained in medicine, we are trained to find um, patterns of symptoms that can tell us what people, what kind of disease they are, have, or illness they have, but in that training, we have too much ignored that a patient is not just a body with symptoms, a patient is a complete whole, an integral uh, body with a history and with a life. And this brought me to some thoughts about uh, why is it that we ignore this uh, thing of a patient that they're actually a full human with an identity. What is it that we have lost in our scientific endeavors? This brought me, next please, to an important philosopher, uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Levinas, uh, who is uh, Lithuanian but worked in France for most of his life. And one of his expressions, which I like to cite, is the eye from head to foot and to the bone marrow is vulnerability. And this, um, this term vulnerability is closely related to who am I, who I am, and whatever affects me makes me aware of it um, interestingly uh, this is a concept that hasn't been used much in medicine uh, there is one important uh, author here in norway a general practitioner uh, who is an expert on qualitative methods kirsti malteru m-a-l T-E-R-U-D, who has written uh, a bit about it, but in general, it's not much mentioned in medical literature. And just for a little thought, I have a picture for you here. Uh, next, please. When you see this picture, I usually ask audiences, what do you see here? And it's a fun uh, exercise that we can't do here uh, on the internet, but it's really interesting to hear what people come up with when they see it. And the question that I raise when I see this picture, next please, is who has the power and who is most vulnerable? And most of us would say that the, the rhino has the power, but actually it's the rhino that is uh, actually threatened by extinction, not the human. And I do this to remind uh, health workers and doctors in particular, who are the ones I mostly teach, that it's not just the patient that's vulnerable, it's also you. And you have to know that, and you have to know in every meeting that you are two vulnerable people uh, trying to connect. And 
Many would say, well, why not vulnerable? I'm the strong one. I'm in the power position. Yes, you are in the power position because of your epistemic knowledge about medicine. But you're also maybe afraid of not doing a good job or afraid of not making the patient happy or reacting to the patient because the patient doesn't really do what you want him or her to do. And that makes you feel maybe not really good at your work. So there is all, always this tension in every encounter between people that there is a power differential, big or small. Uh, and there is uh, uh, the case that both that meet are vulnerable in, in different ways. Next, please. Another concept that I like to bring uh, to the surface is pictured here. And again, I usually ask audiences what they think uh, uh, and imagine when they see this. Uh, I was looking for a picture that could sort of uh, visualize how I would feel if I had some sort of symptom and I had thought for it a while, and then I actually decided that I need someone to help me. I need to go to a doctor and picture myself going out on this uh, tier and, 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 and see what's actually meeting me out there. So this is the problem of uh, uncertainty. Next, please which is always, always present in medicine, that we never really can know exactly what will happen. And the uncertainty can be very, very threatening or not so threatening. Uh, and it, it can be big uh, or small because scientific uncertainty might well be really, really big uh, and sometimes not so big. Uh, an example of the big uncertainty these days is, of course, the, the contagiousness of COVID-19. And I want to sort of reserve that term uncertainty for the cognitive part of life and the cognitive part of working in medicine, that we are actually, um, we are actually uh, not at any time sure how things will go. This is very different from the feeling that that evokes. And we have a specific word in Norwegian that makes this uh, easier to connect to uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty is usikkerhet and insecurity is utrygghet. So they both start with a U and we don't have a specific English word that works perfect here. But I make this distinction between the cognitive uncertainty and the emotional reactions to uncertainty that we need to be aware of all the time. And an important task for a doctor is actually to be able to um, treat uncertainty with uh, safety so that people feel safe even in an uncertain situation. Next, please. Now here comes shared decision making in and which uh, share sharing of decision making has moved towards a concept of shared decision making and the concept of shared decision making uh, uh, has uh, reached a strong focus on an invitation to discuss a case of uncertainty presentation of options elicitation of patient preferences working towards a shared decision uh, with a strong emphasis on how to present scientific uncertainty in a comprehensible way using decision aids. Now, this is an important step forward in works uh, between doctors and patients. So I'm not against it. The challenge is that scientific uncertainty is often really, really complex. It's hard to grasp. Decision aids are fortunately helpful, but in this complexity, the emotional part tends to be 
forgotten or at least uh, put aside because there is so much complexity to this process. And when we talk about the patient input here, it's mostly about their preferences. But preferences, that's some sort of opinion on how to do this or how to do that. But it's also something that's related to how this integral person that we meet feel about it. And I have lots of videos where doctors try to do shared decision making. They really want to do it. But because of the complexity of the issue of scientific uncertainty, it tends to become actually more or less a long lecture from the doctor, not really picking up how much the patient actually gets and how much the patient emotionally reacts. And um, adding to that problem is that in hospitals and as you have seen earlier, maybe also in general practice quite often, the doctor doesn't really know the patient. Next, please. And without contextual insight, you cannot know how your patient deals with and responds to uncertainty. It's not just about preferences. So you have to really take an interest in the patient's life situation and often also life history. Next, please. So because of this thinking and these experiences we had with watching the videos we do have, um, we wrote up a paper with uh, a lot of clever collaborators uh, a few years ago, again in patient education and counseling, where we wrote about shared decision making as an existential journey. And we actually uh, concluded that maybe shared decision making shouldn't just be done as sort of uh, something a duty, uh, an um, ethical duty because of the respect for patient autonomy, but actually it is more about trying to restore the patient's autonomy. So if you look at the next slide that appears in this paper, uh, we have made a very important distinction, I think, between autonomy as a legal right, which is always, it's sort of a one zero thing. Either you are autonomous or you are not. You are not if you're not a, an a, adult. You're not if you have lost it because of illness, either psychiatric illness or dementia. Uh, but mostly you do have uh, an autonomy as a legal right. But we want to make the point that it's also a capacity. So you're just not always completely autonomous. And you can see here to the left of the middle in the slide, that you can imagine that if a healthy person gets symptoms and maybe perceives uncertainty about what's happening, at one point he or she will maybe really feel vulnerable and feel dependent on the power of others and will seek, for example, a physician. And to a larger or a smaller extent, you can think of their autonomous capacity as reduced at that point. And in that meeting, and we write a lot about it in that paper, there are lots of things happening that can actually make the patient even less autonomous or more autonomous. Uh, there is a potential range of autonomous capacity coming out of that meeting. And in that discussion between these people, there is the power differential, there is the trust, how much there is trust, 
there is the complexity of the scientific uncertainty. There is the personal vulnerability, which can differ between the people. There is the agency of the two and also the responsibility and how they feel about being responsible for, for the treatment. So this is not a game, but you could look at it sort of as a game where there are several kinds of outcomes. And our conclusion in that paper was that uh, shared decision making actually, sh it's more important that we think of it as a process with the goal of restoring, increasing the patient's autonomous capacity, more important than actually doing it just because we should respect patient autonomy. Next, please. And this brings me to an important theory that I will not say a lot about. You can read for yourself. But uh, there are two psychologists, Ryan and DC. I don't know actually how he uh, pronounces his name. Maybe it's DC. It's about self-determination theory, and the paper appeared in American Psychologists in the year 2000. And they uh, call their theory a meta-theory of motivation, actually. In that, they propose that man has three basic needs that must be satisfied to thrive. And that is that we have to feel that we are competent, we have to feel that we are autonomous, and we have to feel that we belong. And this brings me to the last slide, because uh, I really feel that this has important uh, bearings on shared decision making. I think the implication for shared decision making of their theory, which I much endorse, is actually contextualizing. So I say that information, when we, when we provide information to patient, we must take the patient's context into account. It has to be a dialogic process. And doing that, we actually foster a feeling of bringing relevant information to the discussion with the patient. So the patient feels more competent because he or she is actually part of a discussion where they have something to bring in. And that's helpful by itself. And then, secondly, the patient uh, is encouraged to participate. However, lack of willingness, for whatever reason, should be respected. I've seen several videos where patients actually are invited to participate, but clearly say no. Uh, they put the whole uh, uh, destiny in the doctor's hands, and that's what they want to do. And then the doctor goes on telling about the pros and cons without respecting that no. So that's actually not giving the patient a feeling of being autonomous. That's more or less persuading the patient. And that's really important to avoid, I think. And last, the doctor must not abdicate from responsibility, but rather strengthen the bond with the patient. So if the patient has the feeling that this, this decision is so difficult that the doctor is actually leaving it over to me, it's okay if they accept it and they understand why, and it's really something that they like, but if they feel that it's because the doctor is actually uh, moving away from, away from responsibility or actually abdicating uh, for whatever reason, they may feel uh, dismissed or uh, just left uh, alone and may not really feel that they belong neither to this doctor nor actually to the world because they're, they're maybe facing an existential uh, situation where it's a very much at stake. And then suddenly they are told that they should decide for themselves. I don't say that all people who advocate shared decision making um, uh, say 
that this is the way to do it. I have seen videos, demonstration videos on the internet from, uh, from the United States where if patients tell the doctor or ask the doctor, oh, it's so difficult, doctor. Uh, I don't know what to do. What, what would you have done if it was your mother? And then as a demonstration of how a doctor should respond, the doctor is just then saying that, mm, well, I can't tell you because I'm not you and my mother is not your mother. I think that is actually a sign of abandoning. I understand the theory behind that thinking, but if I was a patient and asked the doctor this question, I would have loved that the doctor said, oh, I understand how difficult this is for you. It would have been difficult also for me. Uh, and maybe after uh, an, a short exchange of gazes or uh, back channeling, maybe say that, well, but I still, I, I think that if it was my mother, I probably would have. And then con uh, uh, continue the discussion. Um, I think I could have talked for, for hours about this. I'm, I'm really, really fascinated by meetings between people, how wonderful they complex they are, um, how uh, unique every conversation actually is, and how hard it is to sort of script exactly what a doctor or a nurse should do uh, in every case when they meet a patient and starts discussing doing shared decision making. But it, this is not a case of uh, a skin rash that needs a cream or a salve or an ointment. This is not the case of an infection where the obvious solution is uh, an antibiotic. Uh, this is every time you meet a patient, a unique situation, a unique meeting with one integral person at one specific moment in their life. And the perfect script for that is not existing. It's something you actually create while you're there. And if you do that, of course, you have a sort of a pattern or a, an instruction of, uh, about how to do it, that you actually have, have to really, really be curious about this person right now. And that's my final message to you in this uh, strange situation of not seeing your eyes uh, or your sleeping eyes, or if you have hands up or whatever, I just feel that I would so much have liked to communicate with the audience now, but that will have to be later. Thank you very much.